visiting boston.gov city-council-tv. I'd like to ask all my colleagues and those in attendance to please silence your cell phones, electronic devices at this time. Thank you. I'd also ask, I'd like to ask the public uh, to be respectful and do not disrupt the meetings while you are here. If you are disruptive, unfortunately, you will be asked to leave. And if you feel to comply, you will be escorted out. Please also note that according to council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please? Councilor Williams. Councilor Williams. Yes. Here. Councilor Braden. Here. Councilor Edwards. Here. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Lara. Councilor Lujan. Here. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Here. And Councilor Worrell. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Um, I would like to ask my colleague, Councilor Mejia, to introduce today's clergy, who is a well respected member of the clergy, Reverend Willie Broderick from historic 12th Baptist Church. Um, this is also the home, home church of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King when he was here in, in, in Boston. So it's an honor to have um, Reverend Broderick, but at this time I would like to ask my council colleague, Council Mejia, to please um, introduce the clergy for today. Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Excited to be here, thank you, Councilor Flynn. Um, so I am really excited to have Reverend Broderick here with us this um, afternoon. Um, uh, Reverend Broderick is a law clerk at the firm's corporate um, practice group. Prior to joining, um, Will, uh, Willie was a summer associate for the firm focusing on contract disputes and bankruptcy, white collar and transaction matters. While at the University of Northeastern, in law, Willie was a law clerk for the Federal Reserve Bank um, and a judicial clerk intern for the Honorable Dennis J. Casper. One of the things that we know about Willie is that when he takes the microphone, he is all about speaking from the heart and uplifting the issues of social and racial justice here in the city of Boston. And I'm so incredibly grateful for him showing up here in person today to open us up in prayer. Reverend Broderick is um, a minister a reverend, a senior actually, reverend at uh, the 12th Historic Baptist Church. Reverend Broderick, you now have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is truly a pleasure to bring greetings from the Historic 12th Baptist Church on this day and to bring the prayer for this council. It is truly a pleasure to be with each and every one of you. Let us bow for this time. Most gracious and wise God, we come together on this day thanking you for life, health, and strength. God, we ask your blessings upon the women and men of this council who have been chosen to lead this city in such a time as this. We are especially thankful for their staff and those who serve this city as we celebrate Administrative Professionals Day. But God, so much is happening in Boston. And in times like this, we need leadership that continues to acknowledge the great responsibility to serve each and every constituent equitably. God, my prayer is that this council continues to work hard to ensure that our young people have every opportunity available to them. God, I pray this council works to close opportunity and achievement gaps. I pray that they advocate for families that are facing housing, job, and food insecurity in this season. I pray that they continue to work hard to help us emerge in the midst of this pandemic. And God, I pray that the cries for justice and healing are adhered to by each and every counselor. 
And so as the council leads this important work, I pray, God, that you grant them wisdom, that you grant them courage, and more important, that you grant them peace to do what is needed to be done for each and every neighborhood of Boston. Right now, more than ever, we need your divine power to make the tough decisions, to help us move this city forward and to address the issues of our day. And so as this body deliberates on the business that is before us, I lift up the words of Dr. King that lets us know that the altering measure of a man or woman is not where they stand in moments of comfort or convenience, but where he or she stands in times of challenge and controversy. Our challenges are before us, so let them stand courageous to fight for the people. This is our prayer on this day. This is our hope as we do the work. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Let every heart and mind say, Amen. Thank you, Thank you Reverend. And if, if you're able to um, rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Thank you, Council Mejia, for bringing in Reverend Broderick, an outstanding leader in our city. Thank you, Reverend, for being with us today. Yeah. Mr. Clerk, please let the record reflect that Councilor Mejia is present and Councilor Worrell is also present. Before we start the formal part of the, the agenda, we have a a video presentation from Jazz Boston. And the music you are about to hear is in recognition of International Jazz Day this Saturday. We also want to thank Ken Fields, who is with us in the audience. Ken is the president of the board for Boston Jazz. The video is put together from Jazz Boston. We wanted use, to use this opportunity to share with you the power of the American uh, music in, and jazz, which has since spread across the world as one of America's most beloved exports. With origins in the African American community, jazz cel celebrates creativity and working together. This per performance features uh, an Irish violinist um, by the last name of Macaulay and a South African born pianist, um, Witness Ma Matt Lou, performing a traditional reel called Toss the Feathers. Uh, please enjoy the two-minute performance.
Thank you, and I also wanted to inform you that this Friday evening, in celebration of International Jazz Day, you can register to watch this concert, which will be streamed online, called Jazz Now. Um, so thank you to the wonderful musicians. Appro we're on to the approval of minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on this matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, thank you. The meeting of the last minutes stand as approved. Communication from her honor the mayor. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0536 and 0537. Docket number 0536, message in order authorizing the mayor's office of housing to accept and expend payments in the amount of $40 million from the City of Boston's Inclusionary Development Policy Fund for the purpose of producing and preserving affordable housing in the City of Boston. Docket number 0537, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to apply for, accept, and expend the federal fiscal year 2022 housing and community development funds from the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. This order includes the following grant programs with final awards estimated not to exceed the totals listed. Community block, community development block grant, 18 million. Home improvement partnership program, 7 million. Housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, 4 million. And the emergency solution grant, $2 million. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Docket 0536, 0537 will be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0538. Docket number 0538, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $286,860 in the form of a grant for the Fiscal Year 22 Senior Companion Program awarded by the Corporation for National and Community Service to be administered by the Age Strong Commission. The grant will fund reimbursement for travel and meals plus stipends. Thank you. Docket 0538 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0539. Docket number 0539, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $180,000 in the form of a grant for the Community First Partnership awarded by MassSAVE to be administered by the Environment Department. The grant will fund outreach and engagement with environmental justice communities to drive increased awareness and measurable participation in energy efficiency programs. Thank you, Docket 0539 will be referred to the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0540. Docket number 0540, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $137,753 in the form of a grant for Fiscal Year 22 Retirement Senior Volunteer Program awarded by the Corporation for National and Community Service to be administered by the Age Strong Commission. The grant will fund food and travel reimbursement for senior community service volunteers. Thank you, Docket 0540 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families and Communities, reports of public offices and others. Mr. Clark, please read Docket 0541 to 0544. Docket number 0541, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Ellen Hatch as temporary collector treasurer for a 60 day period, effective April 16, 2022. Docket number 0542, notice was received from the mayor of her absence from the city from 8 a.m. on Tuesday, April 19, 2022, until 8 p.m. on Thursday, April 21st, 2022. Docket number 0543, notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor and papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of March 30th, 2022. In docket number 0544, notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of April 13th, 2022. 
Docket 0541 through 0544 will be placed on file. Reports of committee. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0347. Docket number 0347. The Committee on Arts and Culture to which it was referred on March 9th, 2022. Docket number 0347. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $266,500 in the form of a grant from for the fiscal year 22 Local Cultural Council Program awarded by the Massachusetts Cultural Council to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. The grant will fund innovation arts, humanities, and interpretive sciences programming that enhance the quality of life in our city. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Edwards, Chair of the Committee on Arts, Culture, Special Events. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. We had, a, I think, a very brief hearing about this non-controversial grant that we've received many years in a row from the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we, I wanted to commend the, uh, the Arts Commissioner and the folks who have worked on the local cultural care, or excuse me, the local cultural council program, specifically for prioritizing smaller um, organizations uh, led by BIPOC individuals to make sure that they were first in line to receive some of the re-grants. And I also want to thank them for shouting out the Cultural uh, Council uh, and, and hopefully recruiting more people from Boston to serve on that council to help advise our arts program for the city. But ultimately, it was a great hearing. I think we all asked our questions and ultimately want nothing more than for this money to get in the hands of those who need it. So I move today that we uh, vote uh, for, this for these funds to be accepted. Thank you, Council Edwards, the Chair of the Committee on Arts, Culture, Special Events, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0347. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it, the docket is passed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0402 and 0403 together. Docket number 0402, the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on March 23rd, 2022. Docket number 0402. Message in order approving a supplemental appropriation of $2,954,828 to cover the fiscal year 22 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the City of Boston and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. AFL-CIO Council 93 asks me. The term of the contract is July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. The major provisions of the contract include base wage increases of 2%, 1.5%, and 2% to be given in October of each fiscal year of the contract term. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0403. The Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on March 23rd, 2022, docket 0403. Message in order to reduce the fiscal year 22 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $2,954,828 to provide funding for various department, departments for the fiscal year 22 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the City of Boston and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFL-CIO, Council 93, asks me. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Bach, Chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Council Bach, you have the floor. Much, President Flynn. Um, we held the hearing on this docket, uh, these two dockets, on April 19th, 2022, um, and I want to thank President Flynn for joining me at that hearing. Um, as was mentioned in the um, summary of the docket, uh, this is for AFSME. Uh, we've got uh, 1,040 employees who are covered by this bargaining unit. It's the second of the many unresolved contracts that are outstanding that have come before the council in this session um, for council ratification of their funding. Um, it follows the same pattern as the Senna one that we that we approved a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's, as was mentioned, the 2% raise effective October 2020, the 1.5% October 2021, and then the 2% uh, for October 2022. 
Um, it also includes a $1,000 lump sum payment for each member um, related to the fact that the AFSCME uh, employees across a number of different departments in the city, most of them were really in pretty frontline roles um, during the pandemic. And so that was an item that came up at the bargaining table. Um, like the Senate contract, it also uh, adds Juneteenth as a recognized holiday within the contract um, and also adds a couple of um, wellness days uh, in, in relationship to the vaccine MOA. Um, the, you know, I, one of the things that we discussed in the committee was just, um, you know, Councillor Flynn raised the question of why is that, why is that middle year 1.5 instead of 2%? Um, it partly has to do with the fact that this is the, the contracts that are being settled this year, they kind of have to work with the bargaining reserve that we had for the last, because we're, we're back funding things, right, from prior fiscal years. And so um, there's a little bit of a limitation of scope of, of what was in the bargaining reserve for FY uh, 21 and 22. Um, uh, but again, I think the lump sum payment was part of that conversation. Um, we One of the things we raised was that the council, um, in sort of the last round of big uh, contract resolutions some time ago now, um, in 2015 expressed the fact that, you know, when we're setting a pattern, we want to make sure that our civilian workers in the city um, are, are, you know, seeing their pay increase in ways that are comparable to sworn workers because that's, uh, that's kind of gone out of whack in the last 20 years. Um, so these are civilian, this is AFSCME is the biggest civilian uh, conf, um, union that besides the uh, teachers union that's still outstanding. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a good, good hearing. Um, I will just say that I know, because I've heard from them that we have a large number of AFSCME members who are eager for this to be passed um, because the way this works um, for folks who are new is that folks don't get their retroactive pay increase until this is approved and funded by the council. Um, so I know that there are people waiting on those checks. Um, and you know, I think it's consistent, like I said, with the pattern that's come before us already and that seems um, within the fiscal capacity of the city. Um, we had both Jim Williamson, the budget director, and Lou Mandarini, the special advisor for the mayor, um, come and join us on the 19th. So Mr. Chair, my recommendation um, for these two dockets, again, just operationally, one is for us to actually take the money, draw down the bargaining reserve, which we approved at the last budget cycle, and then the other is to actually appropriate it across these various departments to fund the contract. Um, so my recommendation, Mr. Chair, is that both docket 0402 and 0403 pass. Thank you. Thank you, Council Buck. Council Buck, the Chair on the Committee of City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0402. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it, the docket is passed. Council Bach, the chair on the Committee of City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0403. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay, the ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0434. Docket number 0434, the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on March 30th, 2022. Docket number 0434, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Christopher Cook as a member of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for a term expiring March 30th, 2026, submits a report recommending that his appointment ought to be confirmed. Thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes Council Block, Chair of the Committee of City Services, Innovation <coughs> Technology. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you so much, President Flynn. Um, yeah, we had this hearing last Friday. Um, Christopher Cook, well known to uh, many in this chamber as the city's uh, former chief of environment, energy, and open space, um, has been proposed by the mayor for the three-person board of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. So the Boston Water and Sewer Commission is sort of quasi-independent. It's got its own budget. It does its own bonding. Um, but it is governed by a three-person board that's appointed by the mayor. Um, and this is the seat that's currently up. The, the remaining two seats are both up in early January of next year. Um, the uh, committee heard extensively both from uh, Mr. Cook, who's now the executive director of the Greenway, um, and from Henry Vitale, who's um, the executive director, CFO treasurer of the Water and Sewer Commission. Um, I think the, it was exciting to learn that um, uh, Chris has actually already been serving as one of Boston's appointees uh, at the NWRA, which is the Water Resource Authority um, that, that Boston Water and Sewer really works hand in glove with. So he really already has had some real 
um, learning in the systems. And then, of course, you know, what we spent most of the hearing talking about was the need for water and sewer to really shift towards more green infrastructure, green stormwater management. Um, and it really felt as though um, uh, Mr. Cook's you know, knowledge and experience as a parks person thinking through that piece was gonna really stand us in good stead um, in bringing that green lens um, to the Water and Sewer Commission. Um, in addition to really sort of understanding and empathizing with the nuts and bolts, which as we discussed, these are the people who manage the guts of the city. Um, and uh, it's just super important work to get right. Um, so it was a good hearing. And um, my recommendation today, Mr. Chair, is that uh, the nomination ought to be confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Block. Council Block, the chair on the Committee of City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0434. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed. <coughs> Mr. Kirk, please read docket 0463 and 0464 together. Docket number 0463, the Committee on Ways and Means, to which was referred on April 6, 2022. Docket number 0463. Message in order for your approval. An order authorizing the City of Boston to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA, two statements of interest, which describe and explain the deficiencies and the priority categories for which the City of Boston may be invited to apply to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 0464, the Committee on, Wa on Ways and Means, to which was referred on April 6, 2022. Docket number 0464, message in order for your approval, a revised order authorizing the City of Boston to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, SMSPA, statement of interest for its accelerated repair program for the following schools, Haley Pilot School, Curley K through eight school lower building, Burke High School, Henderson K through 12 inclusion school upper campus, Orenberger School and English High School submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson, chair of the committee on ways and means. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. On Tuesday uh, the 19th, uh, the committee held a hearing on uh, the two dockets, and I'd like to thank my council colleagues, uh, President Flynn, uh, Council Bach, Council Lujan, and Council Rural for joining me in this discussion, and um, also the attendees from the administration from, um, and BPS included. Um, and in discussion, uh, Mr. Bloom, uh, Deputy CFO and um, for BPS, gave an overview of MSW, um, MSBA, stating that um, in a state agency that provides additional funding to local districts to be able to conduct facility improvements and construct new school buildings, he stated that there are two main programs operating um, by the SBA, and the core program supports projects covering into extensive repairs, renovations, additions, renovations, and new school constructions. Um, and um, the accelerated program, ARP, supports projects covering repair, replacements in roofs, windows and doors and boilers um, in an otherwise structurally sound facility. Mr. Bloom also discussed the city's relationship with the um, MSBA program and stating that BPS has approved approximately 206 million reimbursements for the MSBA since uh, 2015, which helped fund 31 schools projects. Um, it was explained that the two dockets present authorization to submit um, SOIs for two core projects, uh, docket 0463, and the correction in the previous approved ARP SOIs for six schools um, for docket 0464. Uh, regarding next steps, the MSBA will review SOIs over uh, summer and fall 2022, leading to decision in late 2022, uh, early winter 2023, following with BPS would return to the council for um, funding authorizations. Um, as a chair of the Committee of Ways and Means, um, to which uh, the following were referred, the docket 0463, um, and I, at, on the schools that the clerk has already listed, um, I recommend that um, I submit this report and recommend that these dockets ought to pass. 
Thank you. Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0463. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passes passage of docket 0464. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0480 to 0482, docket 0483 and Docket 0484 to 0486 together. Document number 0480 through docket 0482, orders for the fiscal year 23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department, and for other post employment benefits. OPEC. Docket number 0483, order for capital fund transfer appropriations and dockets 0484 through 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson, the chair on the Committee on Ways and Means. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, um, the committee held uh, hearings um, the Committee of Ways and Means held, uh, began holding hearings to review FY23 budget this past Monday, uh, April 25th, um, 2022. Um, both um, Monday and Tuesday, we held four public hearings for, so far this week, um, two on Monday, two on Tuesday. On Monday, we held the city's administration and finance team as well as public facilities for overviews of FY, operate, FY23 operating and capital budgets. Yesterday, we held um, the hearing from the Boston Public Schools for an overview of FY23 budget, and then we held an evening hearing dedicated to public testimony. Um, tomorrow, uh, we will be hearing from BPS um, on these topics uh, from schools, and in the morning, in the morning for academic, I'm sorry, from schools in the morning and then academics in the afternoon. And over the next six weeks, we will continue to review the FY23 budget with departmental hearings and counselor work in sessions to discuss potential amendments. I recommend that these matters remain in committee. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Docket 0480 to docket 0482, docket 0483, and dockets 0484 to, doc to docket 0486 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0545. Docket number 0545. Councilors Braden and Lucien offer the following. Ordinance providing for remote participation in meetings of public bodies. The chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move to suspend the rules and to add Councillor Mejia as an original co-sponsor, please. Council Braden seeks suspension of the rules and to add Council Mejia as a, the third original co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Council Mejia is added to the third as the original co-sponsor. Um, Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I offer this uh, remote participation ordinance today as an amended refile of an, an, issue, an initiative led one year ago by our departing colleague, Senator Edwards. <coughs> We're going to miss you. <laughs> um, Governor Baker and the legislature's uh, extensions of provisions for remote hearings uh, and meetings by public bodies are set to expire within uh, 80 days. And although, and although it will take state action to amend the open meeting law to allow for hybrid meetings for, public, uh, for members of public bodies, it is, it is within our ability to provide for remote participation for members of the public to observe the proceedings of public business, whether through live stream or for real-time observation or via Zoom for public testimony. Uh, I want to acknowledge and appreciate the coalition of advocates who have kept this issue at the forefront, including the ACLU, Common Cause, Mass Public Interest Research Group, the Disability Law Group, and the Boston Center for Independent Living. 
Uh, remote participation is not simply about safety or convenience in the midst of a pandemic, but about, about maintaining equitable and meaningful access to public processes. We cannot simply retreat from pandemic provisions which have been in place for the past 25 months and are set to expire in less than three months. I want to express that I am less uh, uh, concerned uh, I am, I, am, I am less concerned for the Council's preparedness for July 15th, but, that, but for what many of other public body, bodies across the city, the Zoning Board of Appeal, Licensing and the BPDA and more. We notice, we know from experience and talking all across our city that uh, community participation in these public meetings increased uh, during the pandemic with the opportunity to, for remote access and I think that's something we need to continue. I believe that this is also timely uh, in the, with the budget season so that the Council can engage in a conversation with property management and do it to identify City Hall meeting spaces that need equipment uh, investments for tech fit, fit outs. Uh, we do not want uh, implementation to be a burden for any particular city body and hope to engage the, their chairs to discuss capacity support they need in order to standardise the practice by providing, of providing for remote participation. Uh, I also want to appreciate the incredible work that our central staff does in supporting our city council in doing their work and all through the, um, to the, through the pandemic, they very quickly and efficiently pivoted to support us in doing remote uh, hearings and meetings. Uh, and it's greatly appreciated. So. Um, this is about setting a standard for how we continue to engage people with disabilities, seniors, people with limited access to transportation, and people with work and family obligations who would otherwise be unable to attend a meeting in person. And I look forward to, to, advancing, our, um, to advancing this uh, as in our city, working together. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Lujan. Council Lujan. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank um, uh, Councillor Braden for keeping this issue alive and well. Thank you to Senator Edwards also for bringing this up. Um, we know that this is more than just about uh, convenience. It's, uh, it's about being very intentional and in creating democratic process uh, that is accessible to more of our residents. We should always be thinking about how do we bring City Hall out of City Hall and bring it to people. And the remote participation is one way that we can ensure that. Um, we've seen firsthand how remote participation, as Councillor Braden mentioned, has boosted civic engagement um, at all levels throughout our city. And so we have the responsibility to, to continue that and not to roll it away. Um, remote participation in meetings has been a key element in breaking down longstanding barriers to access, um, who gets access to who in City Hall. And we know that access is transactional and um, it is important that we keep the doors, even if they're virtual doors of City Hall, open to our residents. Um, it also allows uh, a lot of our important constituencies to fully participate in the policymaking process. We're talking about people with disabilities, people with limited access to transportation, our low-income uh, workers um, and residents, seniors, people working multiple jobs and having to hustle uh, just to survive. Maybe they can um, hop onto a Zoom. Um, and people who have family responsibilities. We also on the council have been very taking advantage of the fact that some um, parts of our process have been virtual, allowing us to. Uh, uh, multitask and, and attend multiple meetings at a time. Um, you know, some of our virtual access still, there's a lot to build upon it. There, as Councilor Braden said, central staff has done an incredible job here of making it accessible and also ensuring that we maintain community space. But there are also different departments in the city that we have to, you know, work in partnership with them to increase uh, uh, how, they're, uh, how they're allowing the public to access those virtual spaces, including the BPDA. Um, there are important community functions that are turned off, even in the virtual space, that I think are important for a community gathering to really mimic what it's like to be in person. So um, I also want to thank the incredible advocates who have been working on this issue, um, the ACLU, Common Cause, Disability Law Center, and others that were mentioned by Councilor Braden. We should really take what we've learned during the pandemic, which was, uh, of course, um, an unfortunate, uh, continues to be an unfortunate event, but you know, build on the strengths that we were able to and one of them is virtual uh, participation, uh, access to democracy, really bring it to the people. So thank you, Councilor Braden. I look forward to working with you and Councilor Mejia on this, on this effort. Thank you, Councilor Ujan. The chair recognizes 
Council Mejia, Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my colleagues, Councilor Breeden and Louis Jen, for having me on a, as a co-sponsor. And I also want to give a shout out to Senator Edwards. Um, I remember when I first started working here, um, one of the things that I was asked on the campaign trail is what would be my first hearing. And I said, I'm going to do a hearing on public hearings. Not really understanding kind of the fact of the matter is, is that most people really deeply want to be engaged but just didn't have access. And oftentimes we would host hearings at times that were inconvenient for people who were most impacted. So along the way, I made commitments about we're going to make it open and we're going to do all of this amazing work to make sure that the power of the people and the voices of the people are uplifted. And here we are. Um, when we started working here in 2020, um, we were set to, you know, we had like 12 hearing orders in, in one session. Thank you to uh, Jacob de Blakecourt for his leadership in that space. And then we had to go remote. COVID came and really created an opportunity for us to really show what is possible in, in terms of creating space for people to really participate. And I think that for us in that journey, we've learned that we can do this and we have an opportunity to continue to engage folks in this process. Um, after we filed that hearing order, we went right into, into the world of uh, virtual reality and we made it happen. And that experience was shocking to all of us, um, but, we, uh, but it was also a teachable moment because as soon as we made that transition to virtual events, we began to see a crowd of people who had never been engaged with the council before. We were able to meet people who were otherwise wouldn't be able to um, be in direct community with the city either because of language barriers, accessibility concerns, or simply just because they didn't have the time to come down to City Hall. Through this ordinance, we have an opportunity to keep the channels of communication open so that more voices and more people can be heard and centered in the process. As the chair of the Committee on Government Accountability and Transparency and Accessibility, part of my job is to ensure that people who have never been part of the process are centered in this work. I see this ordinance as a tool that can help us achieve those goals of accountability, transparency, and accessibility. And this is our moment to create a gold standard for our community collaboration in the city of Boston. I look forward to the work and to collaborating alongside my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name as a, as a sponsor to this? Please add Councilor Bork. Please add Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Baker. I didn't know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please um, with, withdraw that one, Mr. Clerk. Yep. Um, Please add Councilor Murphy, Councilor Laurel, and please add the chair. Docket 0545 will be, be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. For the, for the next docket, which is Docket 0546, I would like to ask Councilor Edwards to, to stay in here as the, as the chair. Mr. Clerk, would you please read the docket? Docket number 0546. Councilor, Councilors Flynn and Lara offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss increasing access to swimming lessons and awareness of water safety. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, may I suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Fernandez Anderson as an original co-sponsor? Seeing no objections, uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson is added as a third co-sponsor. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Thank you to my colleagues, Councillor Fernandez Anderson and Councillor Lara as well. Um, this hearing order would be to address the important role that swimming can play in our city. Our city is surrounded by the ocean and 60 60 percent of the of the young people that drowned across across the country are our communities of color many of the many of them don't have access to swimming lessons so this 
this hearing order will to, would be to address the important role swimming plays in our city and to encourage BPS, to encourage BCYF to provide free or reduced swimming lessons to children across Boston, um, children with disabilities, immigrant children, children of color, but, but all children, uh, to make sure that they have access to uh, swimming lessons. It's a critical, it's a critical aspect of, of life in Boston. As I mentioned, we're surrounded by the oceans. We also have many pools across the city that are shut down right now for various reasons. This would be a tremendous opportunity for us during the budget process to address those issues as well. Um, we also need more lifeguards across the city. It's important to train young people about first aid, but also about, about the important role swimming plays in our city. In our city. Um, so I'm excited about this hearing order. It's, it's a public health issue. It's also a, a, a public safety issue as well. And all kids in Boston should have access to free swimming lessons. And glad to partner with um, Council Fernandez Anderson and Council Lara on, on this hearing order. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the chair recognizes Council Lara. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to President Flynn for continuing to be a champion on this work and this issue, and to Councilor Fernandez Anderson for co-sponsoring this matter with us. Uh, there's been a lot of recent discussion about pool closures in the city, and it's really been centered around pool usage. And I believe that we're really having the wrong conversation. I don't think that we can look at pool usage in a vacuum without asking why. Why do some people take advantage of um, public pools and why, do, and why others don't. And I think that the answer to that lies in a historical policy failure that's gonna take a policy solution to fix. Uh, according to the Center for Disease Control, black children drown at a rate of almost three times that of white and Latino children. And the Massachusetts Department of Public Health reported that black children made up 25% of drownings all across the state, even though they're only 9% of the child population in Massachusetts. Uh, these kind of racial disparities in swimming trace back to segregation ultimately when black people weren't allowed uh, to swim in public or private pools and even some beaches, and they persisted today. So I think that access, knowledge, and safety are all driving factors in pool usage. And if we wanna ensure that all communities are benefiting from our city facilities, we have to tackle the root causes behind the decline in usage. I am a black woman and I don't know how to swim. Don't worry, I'm working on it. <laughs> but I have the privilege of raising a little boy who loves the water almost as much as he loves his mama. And I wish that every parent and child in Boston could share in that joy, regardless of their race or neighborhood. And increasing access to swim lessons and awareness on water safety is one way that we can move the needle towards equity and truly work to democratize access to recreation in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. I know how to swim. No. Black people don't swim. So uh, most of you know that I was um, born and uh, raised up to the age of 10 in a West African country. Um, it's an archipelago, 10 islands, and I always talk about, you know, uh, if you don't know, this was used as a port for transatlantic trade, slave trade. So it deeply connects with uh, the fact that we come from a land of abundance and swimming and fish and oceans, right? And we can't swim here or our children swim can swim less than um, other populations. So um, I, of course, uh, strongly encourage um, everyone to support this and as well as I think there's an opportunity here for us to also include other communities such as. So now that I'm all grown and you see me cover my goods and stuff, right? Um, I cannot swim in public pools because I have to cover my body. Um, and so as a Muslim woman, um, we would have to have um, non-co-ed swimming days. And so I would like to um, uh, open up the floor to discuss in how that BCYF, and they've been very helpful, but I think there's been some sort of you know, bureaucratic issues in terms of scheduling women-only swimming days. Um, so I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to be all-inclusive in how we include uh, communities of color in teaching swimming lessons. Um, 
love to swim sometimes with you so I can give you some lessons and um, include uh, women only swimming as well with the Islamic community included. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone wish to speak on this matter? Anyone else? Does anyone wish to add their name? If the clerk could please add Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Louis Jen, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, and Councillor Royal. Docket 0546 will be assigned to the Committee on uh, Strong Women, Families, and uh, Communities. Thank you, Council Edwards. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0547. Docket number 0547, Councilors Louis Jean and Worrell offer the following. Order for a hearing to utilize American Rescue Plan Act federal and state COVID recovery funds to create housing options for returning citizens. The Chair recognizes Councilor Lujan, Councilor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'd like to uh, ask to suspend Rule 12 to add as uh, third co-sponsor, Councilor Bach. Seeing and hearing no objection, Councilor Bach is added as the original third um, co-sponsor. Thank you. Um, so this docket really grew out of um, a hearing that we had uh, two weeks ago regarding uh, returning citizens and had the Office of Returning Citizens here and advocates here who themselves are formerly incarcerated folks who are talking about some of the hurdles and challenges uh, they face upon reentry. Uh, this is also National Reentry Week, and so thinking about how we can be uh, use the ARPA money towards equitable recovery. Um, we had a really great hearing uh, that was really led by our advocates and the Office of Returning Citizens, uh, and that was a uh, hearing order co-sponsored by uh, Council Orrell. Um, and Councillor Fernand Anderson, who will also hopefully be teaching me how to swim. Um, but uh, what we're trying to do here is really think about, uh, you know, how we can be using our opera money to help those who are often forgotten and who it is too easy to forget. Uh, when we are talking about housing, you know, uh, we are, as a city council, our body that cares deeply about housing, um, it being a human right, but we also need to think about housing as being healing for populations who have not had the luxury of stability of, of having a place to call home. Um, there's already really great work um, that we heard from happening. Uh, Leslie Cradle um, leads an organization called Justice for Housing that celebrated a, re a report that was issued last week um, called Far From Home that really detailed the, the, the issues that formerly incarcerated and just involved folks face um, when it comes to founding stable housing. She's been working very creatively with the Boston Housing Authority on getting vouchers for um, formerly incarcerated folks, and they've uh, run a really successful pilot. So this is about supporting and creating that work uh, that's already being done by uh, those who are really centered in this issue. And so I want to thank uh, uh, my council colleagues who were there. I think, you know, Councilor Bach was someone who mentioned we should roll this into this the discussion about ARPA money. So really happy to do that. I um, really had really engaging conversations that, uh, Mr. President, you were involved in, in as well. So. Just grateful to for my colleague, council colleagues and the ideas that really came out of that hearing that were really led by the folks who um, you know what it's like to be housing, uh, face housing instability. So really grateful that we can have this conversation as part of the opera recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lujan. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to my co-sponsor, Council Louis Jen. Um, this is a continuation of the returning citizens hearing, which if you haven't seen yet, it was probably one of the most powerful uh, hearings that I have been since on this council. Um, and it's important that we create stability and help protect the focus of individuals while they're trying to reestablish themselves in society. How can we expect um, an individual to focus on workforce development, job hunting, or their job when they're worried about a place to stay? Um, as we are making investments with ARPA dollars, providing stability and investing in people should be our top priorities. There are plenty of barriers when it comes to housing for returning citizens. Therefore, I believe that it's important that we explore what more can we do to make this transition back home smooth. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Councilor Flynn, and thank you to Councilors Lujan and Worrell for including me on this um, and for the hearing that spawned 
uh, as, as uh, Councilor Lejean said, the, this conversation. Um, as I've mentioned before, um, you know, our real hope on the ARPA side is we're gonna have a hearing on Tuesday the 3rd next week at two o'clock to kind of do an initial intro of what the administration's proposing for the 350 million. And then my intention as the committee chair is to have a series of hearings focused on kind of like uh, policy areas in which we might spend the ARPA dollars and really wanna put council proposals alongside administration proposals um, and also really get into the weeds. And one of the things that came up in the, in the returning citizens hearing, you know, is that we're all very excited about the idea of spending a bunch of money on housing, um, but it really matters that this population be able to access some of that housing. And that's not something that's gonna happen by accident. Like there needs to be real program design. Um, and so I think that this is, it's absolutely an appropriate conversation for us to have in the COVID recovery committee. And I wanna make sure we're having it on the front end, not after we've already authorized housing funds and then we find out that none of them are eligible um, for helping the folks. I, I will just say personally that I went and spoke with the, um, with you know, a whole group of returning citizens as part of the office's work last year and everybody's questions were about housing. I mean, and it's just like with any population we know, it's the fundamental to stable stability. And, and that's really uh, what we're seeking. So um, looking forward to this conversation and to putting it side by side in the larger housing conversation for ARPA. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Bork. The Chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for assigning my name on. And, and um, I appreciate people to, thinking about ARPA money in the way that we should be building assets with ARPA money. I'm actually involved in a project that I think is in Brian's district. It's a, already a design building, which would be the first floor would all be job training, and then the subsequent three floors would be set aside for returning citizens. I believe we need to build these, project, the, these projects. We have to be ready for them. There's a project on, on, on um, that's being talked about that is ready with some city infusion. We could get the thing built. Um, but we also have to think about it more than just housing because the returning citizen is gonna need more than just that key into the door. They're gonna need supports, where to go to find a job, how to, how to do this, how to do that, because if you've been incarcerated, you come out, you have to almost relearn how to get on your bike again. So it's, it's, it's more than just a discussion around housing, but I'm thrilled that we're having the conversation about using ARPA money for real purposes that we'll be able to point to. And I think we have to be urgent about this because it's all gonna be gone soon. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Mr. Kirk, uh, please add Councillor Baker. The chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty, right. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, please add my name and thank the, uh, the makers, the original sponsors. Uh, quick um, housekeeping note, the last whereas, there's a typo. Um, it says by providing through the makers, through the chance of the makers, it should say by not providing. Uh, and then lastly, when we have uh, the hearing, just wanna make sure that um, we're sensitive to obviously returning citizens, but we're sensitive to particularly residents in, in public housing, our more vulnerable residents, children and seniors, and that we're raising the issue of, uh, of sorry type offenses uh, when we're thinking about placing uh, individuals in housing and that we just give thought and concern uh, to again, those most vulnerable residents and be judicious around sort of the support of housing, uh, giving folks a second chance, but being cognizant of uh, not uh, putting a, sort of a sorry situation next to a a young family or, or an elderly. Thank you, Mr. President. Th thank you, Council Flaherty. Please add Council Flaherty's name. And before I continue, just want to ask Council Lujan through with Council Flaherty's question um, about that, probably an update that we might have to file at some, at some point, so. it should read through the chair to the makers, it should read um, by not providing. I think if that's, I think that was the intention. So, um, and if they would make that change, then obviously I'm signing on. Th thank you, Council Flaherty, for bringing that to our attention, and thank you, um, Council Lujan. Um, so you will provide a update, I guess, an updated version. Thank you, Council Lujan, and thank you, Council Flaherty. Um, would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Please, please let me know. Would anyone else like to add their name? Please add, Mr. Clark, please add Councillor Braden. 
Councilor Lara, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, and please add the chair. And docket 0547 will be referred to the Committee on Boston's COVID-19 Recovery. <coughs> Mr. Kirk, please read docket 0548, please. Docket number 0548. Councilor Fernandez Anderson offer the following. Resolution to commence making Eid al Fitr a holiday recognized by the City of Boston. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wanted to just uh, clarify uh, really quick for those of you who don't um, know um, when I say assalamu alaikum, I'm saying uh, peace be on to you as a Muslim. We are, um, we greet each other um, in the old customs of religious traditions of wishing peace upon our brothers and sisters. Um, and so we as Muslims celebrate in Muslim, uh, the word Muslim comes from Islam in terms of submitting um, or striving to submit in peace or submission to God. Um, and so it's very um, important for me as the first uh, Muslim elected in the city of Boston um, and as well as the Afri first African um, uh, elected in the city of Boston to create space for uh, other communities, not just my, my, my own, um, but also community, uh, the human community at large. And so in the spirit of uh, creating that space, in the spirit of that um, looking at intersectionalities that bring us together as one people, I believe that it is important that we uh, are able to speak without uh, making others feel threatened that um, we are uh, compromising their space or their advancement in this life, in this uh, society. So. We're cel we celebrate what's called Ramadan, and essentially this is the month when we believe that the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We as Muslims believe that there is one God that unifies all humankind and all creatures and all creation in all of the worlds. In the Quran we say worlds, and God most of the time speaks in the plural sense, we as in one source energy that creates. Uh, or creator. Um, and so I explain, I, I break that down so that when I say I am Muslim, I am saying I am striving, I am uh, making sacrifices, I am working hard to uh, submit, to, be, to become humble. I'm not claiming to be humble, I am saying I'm working to be humble. And so in the month of Ramadan, then we take 30 days for this spiritual cleanse. So we fast. Uh, from dusk till dawn, and is that right? Or dawn till dusk, yes. And then, or the other way around, yeah. <laughs> so it's sun, so sun up to sundown. Um, and um, then we don't drink any water, we uh, refrain from any uh, bad talk, or we try to, so if y'all see me say do something, just <laughs> ask for forgiveness for me. Um, and then we ask all of our brethren and everyone to forgive us, um, and we try our best to show good behavior, because this is when we're striving to be our best selves. And the idea is, if you put this in habit for a period of time that you continue to perpetuate, those types of behavior. At the end of Ramadan, we celebrate by giving to charity. So throughout Ramadan, we pray every night. So if you see me like tired and sleepy, we have to wake up uh, at dawn for what we call Fajr, which is the first prayer. And Jesus, peace be upon him, he prayed five prayers and we follow that essentially as well. And we, so we pray in, 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 at night and then we, after eating, after breaking fast, and then we pray at dawn for the first prayer. At the end of Ramadan, we celebrate for three days, not one. This is called Eid al-Fitr. And so I'd like to um, say Ramadan Mubarak, which is happy Eid. And the response usually you'll hear Ramadan Karim. Um, and today I filed a resolution to, uh, for the city of Boston to recognize um, Eid al-Fitr, the 
end or the closing of Ramadan as an official holiday for the city. And I am encouraging our mayor to also follow with action to recognize it as well as a holiday. I hope that um, everyone here can support my efforts of inclusion. I'd like to thank um, all of the Muslims, brothers and sisters who um, are in attendance today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, and I am asking for suspension and adoption of this resolution today. Thank you. Thank you, Council of Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, I, I, Ramadan Mubarak, and I'm so excited that we're talking about Eid and that we're recognizing um, it as such an important holiday for so many Bostonians. Um, I have a sort of technical city services thing to enter, and it's not going to keep me from voting for the resolution today as kind of an indication of what we'd like to support. Um, but I do think it's worth folks knowing um, we, the city of Boston used to have several municipal holidays that we kept that were above and beyond what the state and the federal government did. And a decade ago, rolled that back under the public sense that we shouldn't have more paid days off at the city level than the other levels of government. Um, so I do think it's, uh, it's worth flagging that right now, the 12 that we have are the 12 that the state has, which is one more than the 11 that the federal government has because we have Patriots Day at the state level. So the two that we got rid of were Evacuation Day and Bunker Hill Day. Um, so I do just want to flag that when it comes to actually adding a municipal holiday such that the city not only acknowledges it but actually gives it as a paid day off and city offices are closed, that that would require more substantial action um, than the resolution that we're taking today. Um, and that it would obviously, related to the collective bargaining uh, items that we talked about a little bit earlier in the meeting, um, the, you know, it's, it's a, because it's a day more that the city is closed of the year, it's a subject of bargaining. Um, and so just sort of wanted to flag that reality um, in terms of, you know, going to, and I know there's also been conversation over time about like, is this something that we should do at Yom Kippur? We also got rid of doing it at Good Friday, which the city used to do a while back. Um, so, I mean, personally, I think there's probably also a conversation to be had here about how the city of Boston has a really robust, um, like, vacation policy for religious observance and make sure that we're celebrating that and that we're not putting workers in a situation of feeling like to celebrate their most holy days, they're gonna kind of get the cold shoulder for taking that time off. So I hope that's a further conversation we can have. Um, but I just wanted to flag that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be voting today in support to express um, the fact that I think the idea of the city of Boston marking Eid and making our, the many members of, the, of Boston who mark Eid feel included and like this is a part of what our community celebrates, I think that's really important. But I do just wanna flag um, the kind of fiscal constraints and the history around municipal holidays and when City Hall is open and shut. So, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name as a co-sponsor? Mr. Kirk, please add Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia. Council Murphy, Council Worrell, please add the chair. Council Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of 0548. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it, the resolution has passed. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, um, I will now ask to take things out of order and we'll ask the clerk to read docket 0551 first and then we'll come back to dockets 0549 and 0550. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Clerk, will you please read docket 0551? Docket number 0551, Councilor Braden off of the following. Resolution calling on the Massachusetts Legislature and the MBTA to advance low-income transit fares. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the MBTA has continuously implemented uh, fare hikes after fare hike uh, and is now proposing a $3 fee to obtain the physical Charlie card. So 
no, no fare included just to get the card, you have to pay three, $3, but not uh, to contactless or mobile wallets. Further widening the divide between those who can afford to go cashless and those who may be less financially resourced or are underbanked. But for years, transit advocates have called on the MBTA to implement a low income fare, which would greatly increase accessibility and ridership, while also expanding revenue sources to riders who otherwise would not take the tea. The initiative came cl close last year, but was vetoed by Governor Baker. With federal pandemic relief funds, the MBTA has a means to enact a year-long low-income fare pilot, which would uh, total less than 2% of their annual budget. There's also legislation pending at the State House, which would direct the MBTA to adopt a permanent low-income fare program and allow the regional transit authorities to go to have a reduced fare or fare-free uh, programs. We must swiftly implement reduced fare access for riders who would benefit the most, while simultaneously pushing to expand fare-free pilots. I offer this resolution calling on the MBTA to adopt a low-income fare program before setting any new fees in place and urging the Legislature to take swift action on low income for low-income riders. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Yeah, I just want to say how important this is and say that when I was at the um, Boston Housing Authority, this was something that we brought up with the um, MBTA every time we met with them on a joint issue is just like how much the MBTA fare can be a barrier and especially the way that certain transfers don't work for our communities. Um, and just like, you know, it may seem, you know, for folks with more like the price of one T um, you know, like trip is not that high, but it really can add up and it can um, limit the access of our, our young people and folks in low-income communities to all kinds of goods and services and opportunities and the freedom to travel. So I just, um, I really strongly agree that, although personally I would, I would like to see us move towards a free um, MBTA, I think that uh, thinking about robust options for our low-income residents is really important. So in the meantime, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Bach. Anyone else like to speak on this or add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Council Bach, please add Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Jean, Council Mejia, Council Murphy, and please add the chair. Council Braden seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0551. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The resolution has been adopted. We will now come back to docket 0549. Um, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0549. Docket number 0549, Councilors Bach and Flynn offer the following. Resolution recognizing the bicentenary of the incorporation of the city of Boston. Chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to rise on this today and, uh, and talk a little bit about it and also to speak to the um, So 200 years ago, uh, Boston transitioned from being a town to being a city. Um, so folks will know that we're looking forward to the 400th anniversary of the city in 2030, uh, but that goes back to the 1630 date. And uh, it, we were a town for almost 200 years. Um, and then, uh, you know, there was series, a series of very uh, disaggregated town boards and it was getting kind of unwieldy and after lots and lots of debate and back and forth, um, the uh, residents of Boston, enough of them decided to ask the state legislature to act that they passed an act establishing the city of Boston, which was then um, ratified by a vote in the city. Uh, and, um, and then the election of the first mayor happened in April of uh, 1822 and then um, the former selectmen transferred the papers of the city and the responsibility for the city to the new mayor and our predecessors, the first city council, um, on May 1st, 1822. Um, so obviously the 200 uh, marker of that is this Sunday. Um, and uh, to commemorate that, we're gonna have a commemorative program um, at Old South Meeting House. Doors are opening at four. 
and then um, at 4.30 uh, we'll be starting the program, and then right after it wraps up, around 5.15 or so, we're gonna do a little procession um, from uh, Old South Meeting House to Old City Hall, to New City Hall to raise the city flag outside. Um, and so uh, Mayor will be there, I'll be there, I'm inviting all colleagues and members of the public to come. Um, and you know, we're really, we're really trying to use this as a chance both to commemorate Boston's history and to think about kind of the future of more inclusive commemoration in the city. Um, so we will, at that occasion, be hearing from members of the Massachusetts tribe um, who were here before this town or city of Boston were ever established. Um, we'll, we'll hear some brief comments about uh, Boston's black community in the 19th century, which was really vibrant at the time of 1822, but mostly were not able to vote on incorporation, um, and talk a bit about the, uh, the history of incorporation and kind of what it's meant for Boston and our ability to have robust municipal services and uh, enter into collective action together and kind of um, fight our corner at the state and everything to be, as a city. Um, we'll also have a remark from labor as May 1st is also uh, May Day, as people may know. Um, and uh, it should be a good opportunity um, to commemorate and to kind of uh, lay down a marker for the types of um, ways we'd like to commemorate history in the city as we um, work on launching the commemoration commission um, that we passed last fall. Uh, so I'm excited about it. We will send a formal invite out to counselors, um, but that's this Sunday. If you're able to join us, it's at 4.30, so it's late enough that it's after the Greek parade, um, <laughs> after the Hangzhou 40th. So it's gonna be a busy day in the city. We know lots of labor action. Um, it's also May Day, um, but uh, definitely, um, you know, in 100 years ago in 1922, uh, in the Curley administration, one of them, um, they did a, a similar procession, and there's actually photos of them outside of Old City Hall commemorating 100 years of Boston being a city. Um, so we're trying to, 200 years on, also lay down that marker. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, the Chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards, and thank you, Councilor Bach, for bringing this forward and for asking me to uh, be part of it. I, I wanted to highlight the incredible role that immigrants have played in our, in our proud history, 200 years, and often that history is overlooked. And let me just highlight a couple groups. The, the Irish came to this city and we celebrated their arrival recently. It was the 175th anniversary of the Great Famine. That's when the Irish community left Ireland because they were starving. They came to cities like Boston and New York and established roots here. The other, the other group I would like to highlight is the African American experience here in the United States. Council Block referenced it, but we have some incredible heroes and, and stories that are not known across, across our city or country. We see this older gentleman come in here once in a while, he's friends with myself and, and Councilor Bach and Councilor Flaherty and Baker, Colonel Woodhouse. He's a Tuskegee Airman, and he's in here once, once in a while. Um, and there was a gentleman that I was friendly with in the mid, mid 80s, 80s, his na name was Deputy Superintendent Saunders. African-American superintendent of the Boston police. He was also a Tuskegee Yemen. But the incredible contributions of African-Americans, sacrifices and contributions that they've made to this country is something that we should celebrate and that we're, we're, we're proud of. And then there are so many different groups that have contributed so much that it would be, it'd be fun as we celebrate to recognize a lot of our proud immigrant roots but then the, then the third group I just wanted to briefly highlight is, is the Chinese. The Chinese came to, came to America and helped build the transcontinental railroad, basic, basically connecting the East Coast with the West Coast. And when they connected and they met in Salt Lake City, there was that famous photo, kind of the ribbon cutting, connecting the East and the West, but there wasn't one Asian person in that photo. Um, and so what did the United States do after we built, after the eight Chinese community and the Irish community built the Transcontinental Railroad? Well, we enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, making sure that the Chinese could not come to the United States. So discussing our history is also an opportunity for us to learn about some of the terrible 
mistakes that we've made also, including in incarcerating the Japanese during, during World War II, especially out in, out in the West Coast. Um, Japanese Americans were, were, um, were arrested and placed in, in camps. And here they are, here they were also serving in our armed forces as well. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the incredible contribution so, in, in so many immigrants made to our city, to our country, and I'm proud to partner with um, Council Bach and my colleagues in Mayor Wu on this. Um, thank you, Council Bach. Does anyone else wish to speak on this matter? Uh, anyone wish to add their name? Mr. Clerk, could you please add Councillor Baker, Councillor Braden, Councillor Lara, Councillor Luigian, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, and Councillor Worrell. And Councillor Flaherty. Councillors Bach and Flynn seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0549. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Aye. The ayes have it. The resolution has been adopted. Um, Mr. Clerk. Please read docket 0550. Docket number 0550, Councilors Braden and Flynn offered the following resolution in support of the Greater Boston Starbucks Workers United. The chair recognizes <coughs> Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I move to suspend the rules and add Councilor Bach as an original co sponsor, please. Um, um, seeing no opposition, uh, Councilor Bach is added as a third co-sponsor. Thank you. Uh, from Starbucks to Amazon and soon enough Apple, we may be seeing the most significant mo moment in the country's labor movement where the pandemic is not only shifting the future of work, but workers are building collective power for a unified voice and better workplace conditions. 16 Starbucks stores in Massachusetts have filed to unionize, including seven right here in Boston three in Austin Brighton and the rest in the Longwood, Back Bay, Downtown and the South End. Two weeks ago, the stores at 1304 Carm Ave in Alston and Coolidge Corner in Brookline voted unanimously to become the first two Starbucks to unionize in Massachusetts. And next Tuesday, May 3rd, in the, ele and in the election vote count for three more stores in Alston, Brighton and in Longwood. While the concentration of Starbucks stores organizing in my district, my office has, um, has been uh, repeatedly contacted by regional uh, corporate representatives. However, like many across the country, Starbucks workers have reported to my office the aggressive union busting tactics, including a captive audience and one-to-one -to -one meetings with misinformation as well as increased surveillance and corporate personnel traveling in from outside the region to put pressure on, on um, staff not to unionize. I want to acknowledge and extend my support to the, Star to the Starbucks partners and union organizers who are in the chamber with us today. Thank you so much. And I urge my colleagues to join me in adopting this resolution to support Greater Boston Starbucks Workers United and call on the company to drop their union busting and election interference. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, and thank you, Councillor Braden, for allowing me to join, join you on this important matter. This, this body has a long history of supporting the rights of working men and women across Greater Boston, across our, our state as well. I have two Starbucks in my district, one in the South End and one in downtown Boston that are going to prepare for, hopefully, to become uh, part of the union. Um, Council Braden highlighted some of the strong tactics management is using to discourage workers from joining a union. Um, Boston, has always had a, Boston has always been a proud union and labor city. And we stand here with the workers because these workers are our neighbors, our family, um, they're our little league coach. They might, not be, they might not be known to us today, 
but it's important that their voices are heard. More of these restaurants and more of these um, shops are opening up, Starbucks across the city, but it's important that they have an opportunity to earn a decent wage, to have some health care, to have dignity in retirement, um, and, to, and to be treated fairly and treated with respect. So I just want to say thank you to my colleague, um, Council Braden, for allowing me to join her. But I, I also want to thank my colleagues here in the City Council that have long supported the rights of workers to organize here across the city and really across the country as well. Thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Officer Green. I think we all know that the reality of unionization in America is a two-track story in which the, we have a few industries um, and the public sector in which there's still some you know, strength in unionization and then just a lot of uh, private industries where we see a dramatic decline. And the only way we're gonna turn that around is if we get unionization of the really large uh, corporate conglomerates across the country, especially in the service industry. And so I just think that it is, I mean, the two most important things going on for like actually having people power rather than corporate power run the country are probably the Starbucks and Amazon unionization drives that are happening right now. Um, and it's incumbent upon all of us to support those efforts wherever they hit in our patch here in the city of Boston. And so I'm strongly in support of the Starbucks workers who are attempting to unionize um, in my district, District 8, um, and will be of, of any who come forward and would be of Dunkin' Donuts workers or any other large industry where workers want to say, hey, we've had enough and uh, we really need a seat at the table and, and good, strong, equitable working conditions. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, does anyone else wish to speak on the matter? Does anyone wish to add their name? Uh, we'd like, um, Mr. Clerk, could you please add uh, Councillor Baker, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Luisian, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, and Councillor Waroff. Uh, Councillors Braden, uh, Flynn, and Bach seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0550. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Aye. The ayes have it. The resolution has been adopted. Thank you, Council Edwards. We're on to we're on to personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0552, please. Docket number 0552, Council of Flynn for Council of Flaherty. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules, passage of docket 0522. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0553. Docket number 0553, Council of Flynn for Council of Murphy. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules, passage of docket 0553. All those in favor say aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, the docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0554. Docket number 0554, Council of Flynn, offer the following appointment for temporary employees. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules of passage of docket 0554. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, the docket is passed. We're on to late files. I am informed by the Clerk that, the, that there are two late file matters the late file matters include a, a letter of absence from Council at Royal and a communication from Council at Royal. The late file matter should be on everyone's desk. We will need to take a vote to add these items into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matter into the agenda say aye. Aye. Thank you. The late file matter has been added to the agenda. We're in a brief recess.
We're back in session. Thank you. Now we're moving on to late files. I'm informed by the clerk that we have several late files, a letter of absence from Council Arroyo, a communication from Council Arroyo, the late file matters now should be on everyone's desk. We will take a vote to add these items into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the late file matter into the agenda say aye. aye. Thank you. The late file matters have been added to the agenda. Mr. Clerk, please read the first late file matter into the agenda, which is the letter of absence from Council Arroyo. From the Office of City Council, Ricardo Arroyo. Dear Council President Flynn, please be advised I will not be in attendance at the Boston City Council meeting on Wednesday, April 27, 2022. My staff will be attending the meeting and I will thoroughly review the video and meeting minutes. Please ask that the City Clerk read this matter into the public record. Thank you, City Councilor Ricardo Arroyo. Thank you. That late file will be placed on file. Mr. Clerk, please read the second, fi second late file matter into the agenda, which is a, a letter also from Council Arroyo. From the Office of City Council, Ricardo Arroyo. Dear Council President Flynn, as Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, I would like to express my support to bring docket 0321, petition for a special law regarding securing environmental justice in the city of Boston to the floor and defer to my Vice Chair, Council Lu Jen, to pull it from the green sheets. Thank you, Councilor Ricardo Arroyo. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The second late file will be placed on file. We're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. The chair recognizes Councilor Lujan. Councilor Lujan, um, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as Vice Chair of the Government Operations Committee, I would like to pull from the Green Sheets docket number 0321 from page seven of 18 of the Green Sheets or page 80 of the agenda packet. M Mr. Clerk, will you please read docket 0321 into the record? It should be on page seven of 18 in the Green Sheets. Docket number 0321, uh, sponsored by Councilor Edwards, petition for a special law regarding securing environmental justice in the city of Boston. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, can you please poll the committee members to see if they would allow the docket to come before the body? 
members of the Government Operations Committee, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Luis Jen. Yes. Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Bosch. Yes. And Councilor Flaherty and Councilor Edwards. Thank you. Docket 0321 is now properly before the body. Council Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, for pulling this uh, docket from the green sheets. There was a working session held on this home rule petition that was offered by Councilor Edwards regarding uh, environmental justice in the city of Boston and making sure that uh, community can be involved, in, uh, there can be more of a say on the community process when it comes to um, uh, public corporations uh, and uh, issuing permits and licensing and siting for them. Uh, we know that our city is one that is experiencing uh, the climate crisis and we need to be very vigilant, whether it's you know the substation in East Boston or anywhere else in our city, that we are putting the needs of community before um, you know corporations that are not heeding the needs or not, you know, the primary focus isn't addressing the climate crisis. So um, I am going to uh, allow, you know, you know, Councilor Edwards will speak more because this is our home rule petition, but there's a very successful working session on this matter. Um, and I have full confidence that uh, as Senator Edwards, she will be able to advocate valiantly for this home rule petition once it's at the State House. So thank you very much, Senator Edwards. Thank you, Councilor Lujan. The Chair recognizes Councilor Edwards, Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to move that the uh, that the version and the green sheets be replaced by an event amended um, draft. I did not get that right, Alex. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I I would like the better version <laughs> to replace. <laughs> sorry. A, a motion to amend. Do we have a second for the motion? Second, Councilor Braden. Um, the amended, the amended draft is now before the body. All those in favor of the amended version, say aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Just to remind folks um, what this home rule petition does. Uh, as um, Councilor Regine quickly summarized, this is a home rule petition that really is allowing two major concepts. Uh, first is that for the first time in our zoning uh, code in Boston, we, we would be putting in environmental justice standards as a reason for uh, enforcement for the building commissioner. Those standards will be making sure that as just like with our sanitation code, just like uh, with our density and all other aspects and safety, that our building commissioner now has one more tool in the toolbox to make sure that we are safe and to make sure that we are actually compliant and honestly that we are meeting our constitutional, our, our constitutional rights, which under Article 97 is the right to clean air and water in the state of Massachusetts. And so this is just being consistent with that right. The other component of this is changing the process uh, to make sure that a utility company cannot just forego local authority, local scrutiny, and local voices and put their facilities wherever they want in the city of Boston. Right now, you can, as a public service corporation, you can petition to the state DPU to forego all local zoning and simply ask that they decide for the city of Boston where is the best location. This takes that away and says, actually, we think the Boston Zoning Commission can determine that and should come up with the regulations and standards for how we're going to cite utility companies. This is not a form of nimbyism. This is a matter of local control. If we're going to become greener, if we're going to build the infrastructure, I do think the city of Boston should be coming up with those standards for doing that. We do want to see electrification of much of our utilities, of our buses, and all of that is something that can happen with this. So after a really robust hearing, and I want to thank all of the folks for coming, um, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, especially in uh, asking that we insert a language that assured that there were two things that would happen. One, uh, that with uh, Councilor Mejia's suggestion that the Boston Zoning Commission would have to consult with environmental justice advocates and stakeholders, as well as, um, I think it was 
the Climate Law Foundation suggested that they also consult with the Environmental Advisory Council from the state to make sure that when we're coming up with these regulations, it isn't in a silo and it isn't without the people who we're trying to protect. So thank you very much, Council Mejia. Council Murphy especially asked also that we come up with, and Council Mejia again, asked that we come up with a, a report, um, the bad actors, the dashboard, to make sure that after a year of this enforcement, we actually know who is doing what and where and why. And again, to guard against the nimbyism and people, as Councilor uh, Murphy said, we just don't want someone waking up one day saying they hate the competition across from them and they'll use any excuse like environmental justice. We really want a standard. So thank you both for that robust back and forth, making sure also that all of our standards, our warnings, and our protections are in more than one language. So we're very, ex I'm very excited about presenting this um, and hopefully we will vote this out. The mayor's uh, office and I have been discussing about this particular, um, uh, this home rule petition and I believe the mayor is in favor of it. And finally, um, I did keep the language in that makes it amendable so that it can be flexibly discussed at the State House. Uh, but it is my hope that you will give me this parting gift <laughs> of work <laughs> and that I can take this uh, once it's signed by the mayor at the State House and, and fight still for our city that we love. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. We will now vote on the amended draft of docket 0321. Uh, before we do vote on that, I want to give my colleagues the opportunity to um, weigh in if they'd like to speak on it. If, uh, if you would, please uh, raise your hand. We'll now vote on the amended draft of docket 0321. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. Docket 0321 has passed in an amended draft. Congratulations. We are going to go to the consent agenda, but before I do that, I do, I do want to recognize two of our former colleagues that are here. Um, Councillor Zakem is here. Good to be with you, Josh. And Clerk Maureen Feeney, who is also a member of this body. Thank you, Maureen, and thank you, Josh, for the incredible work that you've done for the residents of Boston. We're now moving on to the consent agenda. I have been informed by the clerk that there are no additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for the adoption of the consent agenda as, a pre pre as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no, nay, the, the docket has been adopted. Thank you. Um, we're on to announcements. If anyone would like to make any announcements, here's your opportunity. Announcements again. <laughs> Anybody have any announcements? <laughs> Ultimately, yes, but uh, we want to make sure that if there was any other announcements, gen honestly, any, <laughs> any, any announcements in terms of, I would like to be the last to speak so that it's not, you know, so any, any announcements going on in the district? Nothing's happening. Huh? That would be ideal. Yes, Councilor Bach. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, thank you, ma'am. I would like to recognize uh, Councilor Baker. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Madam Senator. Um, this is our opportunity to. I mean, it's a buy, but it's not a buy. You're just gonna be up the street. You're still gonna be around. I have a feeling we're gonna see plenty of you. Um, but you've been interesting to say the least in the last, was it eight years? No, no six four, years? four years. I've only been here four years. That's oh it. my God, I feel like I'm 100. <laughs> but anyway, no, it's been, I think, a learning um, for both of us. Yeah. We've, we've formed a relationship. I don't think we agree on one single issue. Mm -mm. But we were able to have some relationship building in our trip over to Ireland, which I, I hold close to my heart. Me too. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think I've met 
someone that can get as passionate as you can about your issues, right or wrong. <laughs> like I said earlier, I don't think we agree on any issues, but, um, and, and I respect that, and I respect your fire that's in your belly, and I always knew that what you were what you were fighting for was personal to you and and that's that's a you know i know that even though n not being in sync on things i totally i totally respect you and i totally you know i i, I kind of looked at a lot of people around here i'm a little bit older as either a niece or a nephew or something like that i some people used to call me uncle frank sometimes but um, I, I hope that we continue to have our relationship. And I appreciate you reaching out when um, I was under the weather. My wife let me know what was going on. I appreciate that. And, and I'm sorry I wasn't there for, for Easter. So um, you're gonna have a really good career up the State House, give them hell up there, um, you know, and make us proud. Make your district proud, you, you, you know, your district was a difficult district, and you going in there as a black woman not from Boston, mm. you become an honorary, we'll give it to you. You're, you're definitely from Boston, you know what I'm saying? You're definitely a daughter. So um, I don't want to go on too much, but thank you. I love you, you. And, and you're going to do really good things up the State House. Thank you. Thank you. It's official. I'm from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> you heard. It's official. And uh, Councillor Flaherty. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's official. It's Lydia with a Y. It's true. It's true. <laughs> there's lots of Lydias, but there's Lydia with a Y is the Bostonian. Uh, let me, obviously, uh, let you, I want to let you know how much we're going to miss you and how collegial you've been uh, since joining this body. And it's been a pleasure to work alongside of you. We, obviously, as an at-large council, we share a lot of that same turf. Some of my best in long-term and loyal supporters are big supporters of yours throughout your district. And so we immediately kind of connected on that front. And then for folks who didn't know you or were a suspect that you weren't a true Bostonian, uh, they would say, hey, you know, what is she like? And, and, I, and, I, and it's how I feel about you. You're smart. And you're street smart. And in this business, being street smart is better than being smart. <laughs> and you're thoughtful. <laughs> and you're tenacious. And for folks, I'd say to them when they wanted to bring an issue to your, to, to your attention, I'd say just give it a straight scoop, be honest. Don't try to be flim flammy. I said because if she's on your side, uh, she'll go through the wall for you. And, and she's dogged in that sense. And, and that's how you represented your neighborhood, your neighbors, and your constituents. I also had a front row seat, as many of our colleagues did, some of the most trying times in your life. That in a public position, it's really difficult. Um, and to see you go through uh, that tragedy that you went through and with grace and perseverance uh, says that God is good and God has blessed you with so many talents and talents that you're now gonna bring uh, up to the Senate. And I know that we're gonna continue to work together. Obviously, I'm gonna miss you here on the council. You're always welcome back when we see former colleagues come back. Uh, but we're still gonna be doing that same work. Our districts are gonna overlap you continue to call and, 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 and ask for support and help. I'm going to continue to call and ask for support and help, and we're going to continue to work together for the betterment of the people we represent. You learned very early on in your political career that this business is about helping people, and you're passionate about helping people, and that's what's going to carry you. It's what served you well here on the Boston City Council. It's also what's going to serve you well up at Beacon Hill. And uh, I think having a twin also helped in that, having twins and knowing sort of how that twin dynamic uh, happens in a household, I think obviously has, uh, has helped you um, as you, how you approach uh, different issues uh, and challenges that you face. So I, uh, I will miss you personally. Obviously, we're gonna continue to work together. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege to serve with you. Love you and wish you the very best in all your future endeavors. Thank you. Um, Councilor Lujan. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Edwards. Um, you know, we didn't, you know, we overlapped for a period of three months here on the council, but um, I really enjoyed working alongside you and learning from you. 
and you're gonna kill it um, at the state house. You know, I remember just being a little baby old cal- uh, candidate trying to get on your calendar and how hard it was. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like I'll meet with her like a month or two from now. Um, but when we finally were able to, to connect, you gave me some of the best advice, probably the best advice I received from anyone. And I really appreciated that. And I always gave you, I give credit and I always gave you credit for just giving me really great advice. Um, and I just, I know that you're gonna continue to kill it on at the State House. Please make it easy for all of our home rule petitions. Just do, <laughs> do the thing, cause you know how hard it is on the other side. Um, you know, I'm sure folks in Charlestown and the North End and East Boston will continue to say Lydia to me when they see me up in there, up in uh, the neck of the woods. Um, like, no, 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 there are two of, there's, I'm an at-large city councilor. There's another really dope black woman and that's, you know, of course me, cause you are the first, um, really as, as, um, as uh, our colleague, Councilor Baker said, really setting the, setting the trail there um, as a black woman, uh, winning that seat was no easy feat. The first time I met you was um, at the Massachusetts Black Women Lawyers Association, where you talked about um, the successes and challenges that you've experienced as a black woman lawyer in this city. And as a fellow black woman lawyer, I really identify with a lot of what you said. So I will continue to look to you for really good wisdom. Um, and I look forward to our work together in making good trouble here in the city and in the Commonwealth. So thank you, love you, and uh, I bid you adieu. Thank you. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. And I met with Councillor Edwards this morning at, at 10 o'clock and she said to me, um, she didn't want to have this type of, um, <laughs> you know, going around and talking about her, about her. And so what am I doing? I'm going around talking about her. So I'm already breaking the rules. So I apologize about that. But I didn't want to miss this opportunity to um, acknowledge that, you know, acknowledge the incredible job you did here as a city councilor. We started off together uh, four years ago, four and a half years ago. We were sworn in together and became close friends, um, supporters of each other, but more more friends, and respected you as a as a person, but what I, what I respected most about you is the, the upbringing you had as, as the daughter of, 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 a, of her mother was a, a member of the U.S. military. She, your mother served in the U.S. Air Force, but your mother served with, with distinction, but it wasn't easy, it was hard. And, and that's what I admired about you is the perseverance, the determination, the the love you have for your country. We always sponsored various resolutions over the last four years on many topics, but the, the one I always liked most was on women veterans and, and the impact it has on families. But you spoke from your heart and you provided tremendous, um, tr tremendous support to so many veterans and military families. But, I, but besides that, I, I just wanna say you've been a, a very loyal friend, someone I respect, someone I admire, and um, I know you're only going up the street up on Beacon Hill, but we're going to miss you here and just want to say congratulations on being the senator from that wonderful district as well. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Braden. Thank you, Senator Edwards. Um, you know, we're, I'm going to really miss you around here. Um, um, years ago, before you were ever a city councillor, uh, you worked at the Office of Housing Stability, and my, my Mary, my partner, got off the phone this day, and she says, you have to meet this woman. This, this is woman, Lydia Edwards. I just had this amazing conversation, and you, you really got to meet this woman, and you were helping her sort out some, some issue we had as, as landlords. <laughs> and. Um, and so here we are. Um, then I, I came to the city council and, and in those early days, it's such a new space. You were an incredible friend, a mentor. Uh, you were, had offered great advice. I, I echo uh, Councillor Louis Jen's remarks about you give us some really good advice um, as new councillors and I really appreciate that. 
that friendship, that sisterhood, that mentorship that you have given us. Um, I also think I'm so glad that you had that trip to Ireland with uh, our dear friend Frank here, um, and that you got to visit Donegal, which is where my grandmother, my ma my maternal grandmother, is from Donegal. And so I think you know you really sort of have, have taken on that whole. Uh, all love of all things Donegal, and I think we, you deserve to be, make you an honorary Irish woman. Um, because you're, of your appreciation of all of that. And there's other thing, there's, there's this other um, commodity that comes from Ireland, it's hard cider, made by Magners. You've also a great a connoisseur of cider, and you appreciate <laughs> that Magners is the best, the best one to go for. Um, so I'm gonna miss your friendship, I'm, I'm not gonna miss your friendship, I know where you are, you're just up the hill. but. Um, I hope that you won't be a stranger to us, um, and I look forward to continuing the work, wherever the, the pathway may lead us going forward. But I thank you for the journey so far, and I wish you all your best in, your, in the next phase, your great career, that you're going to do some great things up at uh, the State House. All the best. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Rao. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Edwards. And uh, thank you for being a trailblazer, a fighter, and a welcoming spirit. Ever since I came on the council, you received me in welcoming arms and open arms and gave me great advice, and I appreciate that. It means a great deal to me. And uh, what was so impressive, too, is, you know, during this three months, I think you ran two races and then ran a marathon. <laughs> And I think that's just incredible. And I know you're going to do great things over there in the uh, state senate. And then if you can, try to give us more autonomy here back on the city council. We, we would love that. So thank you. Council Murphy. So Senator Edwards, I know we met, we were classmates back in 2017 in our Emerge training. And then a couple you know, years later, we're now colleagues. We've only been here together for a few months, but I love your fight, your spirit, and I know that we'll continue to be strong partners and work together. And the North End and East Boston still have you, so like Councillor Flaherty said, as an at-large councillor, we'll continue to work together and advocate for your community. So good luck, and I know we'll see you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Councillor Bach. <laughs> um, so the first time I met Lydia Edwards, we were in an elevator and she was furious at me mm -hmm. um, and all of the Boston Ward 5 Democrat committee because we had voted for our friend, Jay Livingstone, the man who had personally shoveled eight feet of snow off my grandmother's roof over her, a woman who I had not met until then but who was terribly impressive um, at the forum and who we nonetheless did not endorse. Um, and uh, it was my first time being exposed to that sort of like pure f fury of Lydia's <laughs> that uh, makes you start to wonder whether you've miscalculated the whole situation and actually she's right because it's just so um, white hot. But uh, we got it the second time around. Um, and the, uh, the great irony for me is that by the time Lydia was running for state senate the second time around, I am not sure that I have ever done like supported a candidate for anything, in this case State Senate, where it was so entirely against my personal interest and happiness for them to win um, because it means losing you from the council. Um, and, uh, you know, it's only been two and a half years of overlapping as colleagues, um, but you've just been such an extraordinary friend to me um, and such an extraordinary role model. Um, I. I will, I'll be brief, because I know you think I go on too long at these things, but, um, <laughs> but you know, I think I, we could, I could talk all day about uh, Lydia as a friend, and Michael referenced it, but I think just, I mean, the indomitable spirit of getting through this year, and all the things that you've done in this year after such an incredible loss with Greg, um, and, and the fact that, I mean, to me, you're just a model of uh, being the counselor who is both a big picture policy person, um, who, like like me likes going back and forth on red lines um, and thinking about how to get legislation right um, and is pushing you know the big picture things and gee when it comes to you know affirmatively furthering fair housing or growing funding for AOP or creating your housing trust in East Boston I mean there's just so many things where you've moved the needle in such a big way and 
and, and you know, run the table a little bit while people were off running for mayor. Um, but also Lydia is like a model district counselor. Um, she's the only district counselor who has had me in multiple mayor's offices talking about whether or not they're gonna fix this random curb in East Boston because it's like the question that um, things that, that things hang on along with um, all those big picture things. And so I just think that for me uh, coming along behind you, uh, it's, been, it's been such an education to work with you on the council. Um, but um, early this morning, I, you know, it's, it's National Poetry Month. I wrote you a sonnet. <laughs> Um, it was written at five in the morning, so everyone's got to like grade on a curve here, okay? Um, so I am going to read it to you. I have a copy, so I'm not. I'm only reading this once, guys. But, um, but uh, yeah, I can give it to you after. Um, but yeah, I initially I was going to not speak and just give you the sonnet, and that was going to be my short brief remarks, but it didn't happen. <laughs> but it couldn't help myself, and it didn't happen. Okay, but I think just to say. The thing that I decided to focus on at five in the morning in my poem um, is about the fact that the most impressive thing about Lydia is that she's so competitive that she wants to win every game. And then when she realizes that the rules of the game are stacked against her winning it, she changes them. Like she just rejects the premise that like that things need to be structured this way. And I think you've seen that time and time again with the legislative achievements she's had that are really gonna continue to be things that all of us make use of long after she's gone from the chamber. So this is a sonnet for Lydia Edwards on the occasion of her final Boston City Council meeting. A fighter, a brawler, they say. Well, sure, but better yet, our Lydia is a smith. No cast-offs for her, she makes her own swords, wields law to prove impossible, a myth. Make her mad and she's Lydia Teapot. Watch all that steam coming out of her ears. But passion that scorches will make steel hot then bent to shape by the will that it fears. What shape? A PLA, an HRP, a zoning or charter amendment? Swords and stones for us who come after, see, to be used in a critical moment. So grab the hilt, you Bostonians true. Read the words, Lydia forged me for you. Thank you, thank you. So, Council Mejia. Yes. Um, muchas gracias. De nada. Muchas gracias por todo, porque cada vez que hay un problema en la comunidad latina, con la comunidad inmigrante, tú siempre te aparecida ahí y peleaba por la gente. Gracias. Um, and so I really do appreciate how hard you fight for immigrants, for the Latino community. You speak multiple languages, which goes to show your deep commitment for making sure that everyone is included. So I really do appreciate that. I, I also would like to just say that, um, you know, as the chair of government ops, um, in my first term, you were incredibly uh, generous with um, your ability to help me articulate. Oftentimes I would show up in that space and um, struggle to understand half of the things that people were saying. And you always recognize that even through the Zoom and help translate. And whenever I would ask a question, sometimes the question, um, people understood what the question was, but they didn't want to answer it and you took that moment to help advocate and um, translate on my behalf to make sure that people understood what I had to say. So it is that level of um, dedication that you have um, to folks that I really do appreciate. I um, just, I didn't get all, all, of, all of the mentoring, I, 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 but I am <laughs> looking forward to it once you get to the State House because I do believe that the the work continues and I look forward to building a relationship with you on the other side so that we can move the work forward. So thank you for all that you have done on the council. Looking forward to the work that you will continue to do in the State House. And more importantly, the voices that you will bring into that space. And I know that you will honor them and fight like hell for them. 
because I've seen you do it here, and I know that you will continue to do it everywhere that you go, Lolita. So thank you for always keeping me on my toes um, and for being such a fierce spirit. You're gonna be missed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Um, it's time to say goodbye. And I, I uh, really, I don't normally struggle uh, with what to say in moments, but this, this, this has been very hard. I will say first, thank you um, to a lot of people. I, I, I owe so, such immense gratitude to some people, but we'll start with the OGs. Um, by that, I mean the ones who uh, bust through some of these barriers to allow for some of us to be here today. Um, I'm talking about the OG from Dorchester, Maureen Feeney. I'm talking about Diane Modica from East Boston. I'm talking about uh, Peggy Davis Mullen. And then may she rest in peace, Rosemary Sasson. Uh, these women were part of breaking a lot of barriers and making sure that us, especially as women, um, could be here today. And then, um, for me, at least in my um, in, impact and influence, there was the sensational six. I don't know. Um, I'm the last of the six, actually. Um, we were put on a cover of Boston Magazine, and we took this famous photo. Um, that was me, Ayanna Presley, Anissa Sabi George, Michelle Wu, Andrea Campbell, Kim Janey. And I wish you could have seen us uh, posing for that picture and having to walk and we were laughing at each other because they told us to show up with like purses and hats and Sunday best and like we were like, I'm not wearing a stupid hat and we were just <laughs> laughing and walking and we would, you know, someone, oh, inevitably it was Kim who always did this catwalk and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you walking? Like, and it was just so much fun and uh, when you look at that picture, then it's six city councilors. Uh, now it's a congresswoman future attorney general, senator, mayors. Um, and I think about that and I want to thank them because um, I think Kim and I came in, uh, but the other four women were there before us. Um, and I have to give thanks to my original, my brothers in service at that time too. Um, we were special 13. Of course, uh, Eddie came in, Mike Clarity came in, or was already there. Frank, you were already there. Um, Tim, Tim McCarthy, uh, my friend, Josh Sakum, Matt O'Malley, uh, Mark Siomo, uh, who am I forgetting? I think that was it, yeah. So there's the 13, if that was the, the body at the time. And it was interesting. It was a different dynamic, different kinds of conversations. Um, and I just think back on that time uh, and what to even say, and I, I can have, I honestly have to say thank you. I learned so much. I was, uh, the patience that you gave me, um, the talking to's that I got, and I got several. <laughs> um, and this body is special. It's 13 of us now serving on a body with 40 people. It is completely different and the ability to truly become friends, colleagues, and fighters for each other is something so deeply unique for this body, and I hope that you don't ever give that up. At the end of the day, stand up for each other. You are the Boston City Council, and you should stand with each other. I, um, I wanna also thank um, central staff. I don't, I don't think anybody can really appreciate, uh, especially in the audience who's watching this, central staff allows us to function. We function at their election. 
uh, we had a pandemic, and but for the technological work, uh, Carrie, uh, and getting us and making sure that we could move and literally do our jobs, I, central staff is everything for this body. And so just to name them, Carrie, you lady, Christine, Michelle, Candace, Juan, Cora, Lorraine, Ron, Ashley, I think Shane has left, but Shane was part of central staff as well. Um, I don't know how many political careers you have saved, you lady. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know how many times you have, um, uh, or how many times uh, Carrie just managed to move the camera the right way away from whatever was gonna happen or was happening and saved us from ourselves in the moment. But central staff, you are, um, you're the backbone of this institution. I am so grateful to have to work for you and you've raised such the bar You've raised a huge bar in your approachability, your dedication to the body, uh, and wanting us to be our very best. And you have been attacked. You've been called out. Um, you have been underappreciated. And there was not a day that you didn't meet. You weren't 10 out of 10 every single time. So I want to thank you. And I would like everyone uh, to thank and give a round of applause to central staff. Just for future, you know, thoughts. They really could use a union. Mm -hmm. Uninsured, increased in COLA on a regular basis. Sorry, Mr. President. <laughs> no, um, I, but seriously, we can we we support unions and organized labor everywhere. We should be supporting it here too, and uh, absolutely want to see that happen one day. Um. So to my family, also known as my staff, um, I don't think people understand um, what staff is. I mean, we say it and it, it, it means so much. And it's, you say it like it's this one blob of, of staff because uh, it's just easier to say my brothers, my sisters, my aunts, uh, my rider dies, um, my give their shirt literally off their back because I spilled coffee on mine and I have a TV interview and so Gabriella and I are about the same size so she gave me her clothes. <laughs> um, the text message at like 6 a.m. or something that Greg has died, um, I'm out. I can't deal with anything. And that... Um, if I look like I didn't miss a beat when I lost my partner, it's because my staff was literally holding me up. I mean, it, it was like I was a puppet on a string and they would, uh, if they could have moved my mouth and, and had me move and function, that's what my staff did. Um, I want to thank them each. Lena Tremelli, who's with Age Strong, Janet Knott, who's now retired, Kathy Carangelo, who is uh, with the BPDA, um, I want to thank them deeply. And uh, Joe Wool, what's up? <laughs> Joel, thank you. And Levels, you don't know how much I appreciate. I don't think uh, there's very few people who will um, suffer my wonkiness, <laughs> my immediate need to know the answer-ness, the back and forth and why is this-ness besides uh, Joe, Joe Wool. And when I think of a systemic world where it's equitable, where we people are paid a living wage, where people can afford um, to pay rent or buy a house, when I think about um, children being free from asthma and I say that that's the goal, Joel's mind sets to the systemic problems that block those goals. You are brilliant. You are a dear friend. And thank you for working in the office and being my friend. Um, Ricardo? Ricardo Patron 
uh, joined my office. Uh, I think he worked two days a week, part-time from East Boston. I had never heard of him, and I wasn't sure about him. He showed up wanting to work for me all bright-eyed, bushy-tailed after a very hard-fought city council race. So we're like, and you are? And the answer is um, amazing, kind, loyal, intelligent. He went from part-time to full-time, and then he became my chief of staff. I think the uh, first Latino chief of staff for District 1. He is a guiding light, a straight soldier. But most importantly, Ricardo, um, I think you brought a sense of humor and realness uh, to me. And I think you made me more humorous and real to a lot of people who didn't know me. Um, for some reason, I have this reputation for being uh, rough around the edges, is it? Uh, aggressive, strong, fierce, not to be toyed with. I don't know. But, um, and sometimes that, that reputation, because it's in front of me, a lot of people make assumptions about my heart, um, whether I'm a nice person, whether they can approach me about anything. And I, I have to say, Ricardo, I think you have been one of the biggest breaker of those walls to push that down and remind people I'm just a human being. Remind, remind me that I'm just a human being. So I'm proud of you. I'm so fiercely proud of you. Look at you, press secretary for the mayor. <laughs> Look at you. Look at Joel, chief of staff over at BHA. Look at them. I have good staffers. Um, Jesse? Me and Jesse's daughter are besties. Um, and Jesse is um, a brilliant legal mind. And there's where, where Joel on the policy pushes back and comes back and forth, Jesse does the same, same thing on the legal part. And um, when, we, when Joel left, we needed to hire a new person. And we're like, OK, Jesse, he seems interesting. <laughs> he now works for Rusi, who just laughed really hard. Um, Jess, Jesse is um, that I have to put, and this is the best thing I would say. Jesse reminded me constantly about what parents are dealing with. Uh, Jesse has a two year old, three year old daughter, and well, two when, when you first started. And so it was real for him to say, listen, I have to, I have. I have bedtime, I have this time, I can't do this. And it was so real for us for the first time because we, we were a staff mostly of younger folks or older folks whose kids were out of the house that never did we have to think about babysitting. And Jesse made us think about that. I think you made us a better, stronger staff for that. And then we'd stay up till 3 a.m. and work on that um, groundbreaking historic memorandum arguing why the city of Boston for the first time of any city, should be able to place a question before the people of Boston without the mayor's permission. And we won that argument at the Attorney General and got that charter done. Um, so Jesse, I am extremely proud of you. And I am just honored that you came to work with us for as long as you did. Take care of him, Lucy. Do right by him. Um, to the First Lady of Charlestown, Judy Evers. I just saw today that she has been working at the City Council since 2003. And that's, I think, coming back from a retirement. So if you want to talk about someone dedicated to the city, to the nuts and bolts, to one of the toughest areas of the city, to one of the toughest times of the city, that's Judy Evers. She's in her 80s. And she is rock solid, unapologetically, towny, through and through. And she's amazing. Um, and then we have the confetti master, <laughs> Bonetti. 
from the North End. Um, Benetti, I think you cover up so much of your heart, dedication, and love for this city through humor and sarcasm. But I am telling you, I don't know a truer Bostonian and someone who loves this city, especially the North End, more than Michael Benetti. Um, he, has, he will dedicate and has dedicated his life to that neighborhood. And I hope they truly appreciate him. But um, I'm proud of you. Where you're gonna go, we know. Talk about it loudly one day. But Benetti, I wouldn't be here. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna, I have a, then I have a new class of kind of folks coming in. I don't know if Jake is here. Jake, he was, um, he'll be with Councilor Box office now, but Jake was an incredible person who, on the Senate campaign who uh, worked extremely hard and he's a veteran. And I'm proud that we had him come in our office and work with us. And now he's over at uh, Councilor Bach. He actually lives in our district. Um, then Tesha and Yamina. You two are amazing. Uh, they're Eastie girls. Yamina's shy, 21. And uh, <laughs> I want you to know, she's shy 21 here, but when someone was messing with her sisters and that someone happened to be a Boston police officer, she was fierce and unapologetic and loud and got an apology from the commissioner and the DA to herself and her family and then got a job offer from me because I think that's badass <laughs> and I'm proud of you. You stand up for who you are, proud, young, Muslim, girl, and I am so proud that you're in my office. I know you, Tasha, from church, and all the times I have to go there for confession. <laughs> but uh, Tasha, I don't think people understand. Tasha's heart is in service. I don't know. I, that's how I met you in church over at Teresa's house. Um, you give more than anybody I know. And I hope, and I'm begging you, take that vacation. I'm serious, spoil yourself, because I, I don't know anybody else more deserving of just treating themselves besides you. I had to save these two for um, last. Elaine Donovan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I met Elaine going to the Knights of Columbus and during the campaign. I have to say I had never really been to Charlestown uh, when uh, we decided we we're gonna run for the district city council seat. Her candidate was not running, decided not to run, and she was devastated that her candidate, our dear friend Jack, was not gonna run. So she said she was gonna give me a shot. And I went to the Knights, it was trivia night, and I walk in the door, I'm the only person of color, and I'm like, there's someone named Elaine here, I don't know what she looks like, and she's going like this, and we kind of lock eyes, and she's like, yeah, come over here. And the rest is history. I don't know how many drinks later, <laughs> how much fun we talked, how many, oh gosh, I, what is it, the divorce, everything. Elaine's been there. She is so amazing, a good friend, and she loves Charlestown, Boston, this city. And I think the best thing about Elaine uh, is that she is the realest woman I know. Real recognizes real. And Elaine, you provide that perspective of realness. Whenever I get up, sometimes in the clouds of the wonkiness, you remind me there's someone on the other side of that who needs to pay rent. There's a real family and they need it right now. You remind me and, and educate me about what Boston has been through. You were bused, you know the busing. That's a trauma in Charlestown and throughout the city that you lived through and you educate me all the time about that. It's important to remember how we got here. It's important to remember our history. And I just wanna thank you because I, for everyone's you know, they comment about the fact that I'm a black woman, I represent Charlestown, East Boston, the North End. Uh, 
I read Common Ground in college. I read about Lisa McGough in college, the McGough family. I read about that, that back and forth, that god awful back and forth, uh, school busing. I read and studied Boston's toughest times before I even knew I was going to live in Boston. And the thought that when I would go to church at St. Francis and sit on, sit in the pews, and I'd be thinking, 30, 40 years ago, someone was sitting here praying for the safety of their kids because of busing. I, I thought, wasn't this interesting when I'm walking up Green Street or coming down Bunker Hill, um, going into Grasshopper, owned by the Smith family, and talking to folks and meeting people, what we would have been, would we have been friends if I were their age or if they were mine? I'll never know. Um, I don't have to know. You're my friend now. This is the Boston we live in now, where me and a Frank Baker can go to Ireland together, come back with a bottle of Poutine. We haven't split it yet. <laughs> we will one day. But that's the Boston we live in now, warts and all, back and forth, left, right, whatever you want to call it. It's our city, and Elaine, I couldn't imagine representing this part in Charlestown, this city, without you at my side. I love you. Um, a, Gigi. Gigi called me out of the blue when Sal LaMatina said he wasn't gonna run. And she said, are you gonna run for the city council seat? I said, I don't know. I don't have money. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And she said, I'll quit my job and I will be your campaign manager, whatever you want me to be, if you run. And I ran and that day our campaign started. I didn't even have money to pay Gabriella Coletta. I didn't know where it was gonna come from. She quit her job though. And we ran like hell. We ran all over the place. And yes, I mean, I'll say it now, we ran even in the face of the Boston mayor at the time, we were fearless. And ultimately, sorry, it's my sister. <laughs> um, and I just wanna say, it was your spirit, you're being fearless, you're fighting for everything you had is why I think you're gonna be an excellent city councilor. I love you. You love this district, you love this work, and you were the chief person who kept my head up during the most worst part of my life. Thank you for being my friend, my little sister. Um, I know I've gone on a long time, but I, I tell you, trying to summarize four years of memories and heart and the people who helped you got here, it's worth the time sometimes. It's worth the time. Because so much of how I got here and what we went through is just amazing. Bomb cyclone, Eddie, remember that? We went through that. Um, then there was the day I got my nickname, Lydia with a Y. Remember that, you lady? Yeah, okay. Um, Let's see, I was hoping you didn't, but okay. <laughs> Either way, statute of limitations, all that is gone. By now it's four years at least, I'm sure. Um, then there was the, um, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, there, that, who could forget that fun pandemic we we're still going through and how we had to switch to everything. But I will never forget that night, the first night when we decided we weren't gonna meet again. Um, we all gathered, or a chunk of us gathered in O'Malley's office. I won't say who brought the bottle of whiskey. <laughs> well, we have whiskey here. And um, we sat down and we were all thinking, what's this gonna be like? I can't wait to get back to my life. And then one of us paused and said, who do you think will be the first? And someone said, what, to get, to get COVID? And I said, no, to lose somebody in their district. 
Like, if how's this gonna go? Who's gonna get hurt the most? Are we gonna lose who? What? How? And I'll never forget that because we had no idea how many people we would lose in this time or who would catch it. It's been a, it's been a wild ride. Suffolk Downs, affirmatively furthering fair housing, doing zoning amendments, doing all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but I have to say, man, one, my district is amazing. We do have the best food. And I have the microphone, so <laughs> we have the best food, District 1. Um, and I just have to, I'm grateful, deeply grateful to every single section of my district. Um, the North End, I heard stories about how I would never have been able to walk in the North End years ago. Now I go to St. Leathers on a regular basis. We have meet and greets there. I know folks at the Casa Maria, the Michelangelo. Um, they treat me like I'm their granddaughter. It's true. I mean, once you're in your family, your family. East Boston is my home, has been. I, I guess it's just been the place where newcomers come, where people only second to Ellis Island come to this country and uh, become citizens. We welcome people, we make Americans in East Boston. It is an incredible neighborhood. It is growing sometimes too fast and definitely is getting too expensive, but it is a beautiful neighborhood. And I'm so happy, so happy it's diverse. And si también yo hablo español, gracias a Dios. Entonces yo puedo hablar con tantas personas. Yo falo portugués también. It helps. Um, but I have to come back to Charlestown because I'm leaving as a representative from Charlestown. But Charlestown will always be my home. It was the toughest nut to crack. And I will tell you, they told me, many people told me about Charlestown. And it was, I would never win it. They can barely stand the Italians across the bridge. What do you think they're gonna do with a black girl from East Boston? Oh, by the way, you're not even from East Boston. You're not even from Boston. Uh, you, you're not gonna have a shot. You're liberal. You, you're, you're all everything that they hate. And everybody had a lot of things to tell me about Charlestown. <coughs> and then I went there. And Charlestown said, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Come inside. I talked to mothers who lost their children to addiction I talked to people who were wanting to get into the union. I talked to people who wanted to pay rent. I talked to people who were proud of my mother's military service. Real recognizes real. If there's any advice I give anybody, it's that. Real recognizes real. And ultimately, yeah, we won Charlestown because we were real. We didn't promise too much. We didn't pretend to be anything we weren't. We just said we work hard. And I think I did, Elaine. So I will always represent and fight for Charlestown, even though I'm not their formal elected official. And I just had to say thank you because I will miss deeply. Um, so it's probably the worst speeches I've ever done in my life because <laughs> it's just, just very hard to give. I will say this, the bravest moment of my life, I had two brave moments as a city councilor. One was unexpected and the other I, I felt up against the wall. The one that was unexpected, I was um, learning sign language on vacation, enjoying myself when a god-awful decision came down uh, from a jury that decided that two Boston city workers were guilty. Um, it was the Boston calling decision. And they were guilty of extortion or something obscene for fighting for workers and work union jobs. And I tweeted out, 
this is a horrible decision. They're wrong. They did nothing wrong. And I went back to vacation expecting, you know, fanfare and whatnot. That was the loneliest tweet I ever gave up in my life. Uh, no one said anything for a week. And I was just felt like I was flapping in the wind and it, people said, you know, this is you versus the US attorney. Why would you say anything? I said, because it's, it's wrong that they were convicted of anything. City workers, however, heard and saw that. They came to my office, shook my hand, said thank you for standing up for our friends. And it took about another week or so before other people joined in the chorus. And eventually we had uh, the press conference here where we said, this is enough. If, if them now, us later, who hasn't advocated for workers' rights, who hasn't said you're gonna meet certain standards, who hasn't done this, and if they're going to be accused of extortion for that, then get ready, NAACP. Get ready, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Get ready, ACLU, Planned Parenthood, immigrant organizations. Get ready, because all of us stand up and go on strike and protest and do all those things. And if that's, uh, that could also all be considered extortion. Well, the decision ultimately was overturned. And I just wanna say, being bold sometimes comes accidentally. But you stand your ground, trust your gut. If it's wrong, say it. Whether it's the loneliest tweet in the world, <laughs> don't ever silence yourself. And then the other part, the budget vote, 2020. Uh, I got calls from everybody, including the Cardinal, on uh, weighing in on whether I should do at that moment. Um, so I voted for the budget, as you know, and that broke a lot of my progressive and some people's hearts. And some of my friends felt that they were thrown under the bus. Other people felt that they, as city workers, I was fighting for their jobs. But being up against the wall, and I have to thank my staff for all of that, because they were with me, we realize we're up against the wall because we have a bad choice. Up or down is not real. Up or down is not a real choice. And it's because being pushed up against the wall, having people tell me I broke their heart or having people they love what I did, that I realized this is not a sustainable system. So I changed the rules, right? We changed the rules on how we budget here in Boston. And it breaks my heart. I will not be part of that process. <laughs> I won't even be able to get to do it. Uh, but it wasn't about me. It was about the system. And we changed those rules. And more importantly, we changed the process to change those rules by coming up with a historic way to go with or without the mayor's permission directly to the people of Boston. So, and we stood up over and over again for that, and of course the coalition grew, it was multilingual, incredibly diverse all over the city because everybody understood that. The very fundamental question was, do you want in or not? Do you want to be able to control your money? Do you want to be able to hold us accountable? Do you want to see us fight on the floor? And everybody said yes. So I'm happy about that, I'm happy that the city of Boston leans into boldness. So I'm sad to leave, but it's time. And I love you all, and I'm grateful for all of your friendships. Come over. My building is prettier than this one. <laughs> but this is the realest building I've ever worked in. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for, and thank you. Just thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately after this, immediately after this um, session, we'll we'll stand for a, a photo. We're on to. We're on to memorials at this time. Today we'll, we'll, we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Council Arroyo and Bach, Aidan Conley. For Council Bach, Theodore Ted Victor Brodick. Carl Rick Richter. For Councilors Flaherty and Flynn, Audrey Ruth Williams, Helen McGinnis, Rosemary McCarthy. For Council of Lejeune, Ken Clifton. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today that it does so in those mentioned individuals. We are now scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, May 4th, at 12 noon. At this time, I want to say thank you to the, the clerk and city council central staff. Thank you. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. The council is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>